A crowd of police officers stack up on a door in a small cramped household in Tokyo. They finally crack the door and peer inside, a vicious aura emanating from the back of the room. They slowly enter, watching for movement, when they find him, laid under a thin blanket on his bed, wearing nothing but a pair of long underwear, the mummified remains of Kato Sogen rest silently as the grave. On a bedside table next to the corpse lies a small packet of yellowed pages, a newspaper dated back to 1978. A thick veneer of dust settles across every surface, and motes dance in the air as officers slowly begin to shift Kato from his resting place for the last 30 years. Why would a family seal their grandfather away, alone in a room without food or water, for 30 years? How did he become mummified, and how did the Japanese government never find out? This is the story of how a Buddhist mummy uncovered the disappearance of over 200,000 people, and the drastic lengths we had to go to to get them back. When Japanese government officials arrived at the Kato household to pay aged patriarch Kato Sogen a visit for upcoming Respect for the Aged Day in September 18th, they were surprised when his 53-year-old granddaughter, Tokimi, turned them away, saying, My grandfather is well, but he's refused to meet with anyone. The officials were confused. As of that day, the elder Kato was the oldest person in Tokyo. Wouldn't he and his family want to celebrate this momentous occasion? Kato Sogen was born in 1899. At that time, the car had only just been invented, and human flight was still the fever dream of a handful of naive idealists. By his 111st birthday in 2010, humans had been living in space for 10 years. Time is both incomprehensibly long and blinkingly short. Days later, on the 28th of July, Tokimi approached police admitting that her grandfather had been dead for many years already. This stumped the police even more. What do you mean he's dead already? Sogen lived with his wife, daughter, 81, along with her husband and their two children. But one day, he, quote, shut himself in a first floor room about 30 years ago in line with his Buddhist doctrines, refusing to take food or water, according to Tokimi. He was apparently trying to become a Sokushin Butsu, the result of an ancient Buddhist methodology of meditation so deep that the practitioner becomes mummified alive. The rest of the family never bothered to break into his room to ensure he was still alive. Tokimi continued telling the police, When we looked inside the room in March this year, we saw the skeletal remains of our grandfather. When police were finally able to enter the room, they found Sogen just like Tokimi had described. He was wearing a pair of long underwear and laid tucked under a blanket on his bed. Next to him, on his bedside table, still unread, was a magazine dated back to 1978. With this evidence, police began investigating the Kato family for fraud charges on suspicion that they'd been collecting pension money in Sogen's name for the past six years. A month later, a criminal complaint was filed against the patriarch's daughter, Michiko, and his granddaughter, Tokimi, by the Japan Mutual Aid Association of Public School Teachers. They claimed that the two illegally took pension money Money that would have been payable to Sogens as a widower since his late wife, a former teacher, died back in 2004. The fraud was valued at the time up to over 9.5 million yen, or 100,000 US dollars. With a further 2.7 million yen, the equivalent of 31,000 US dollars, was drawn in just the past month. Then, on Friday, August 27th, Japanese police arrested Michiko and Tokimi for fraud. Months later, the Tokyo District Court sentenced Tokimi to two and a half years in prison, but the judge presiding over the case, Hajime Shimada, suspended the jail time for four years, saying that the defendant committed a malicious crime with the selfish motive of securing revenue for her family. However, she has paid back the pension benefits and expressed remorse for the crime. While the claim that the Kato patriarch was attempting to become a Sokushin Butsu was clearly an attempt to throw off the police from their fraudulent activity, the case drew attention to a little-known Buddhist rite in which monks turned themselves into living Buddhas. But what is a Sokushin Butsu? 
The word translates to a Buddha in this very body and refers to a specific Japanese form of self-inflicted mummification. The practice originated from the Shingon Buddhists in the mountains of Yamagata Prefecture. To become a Sokushin Butsu, monks emulate the techniques of a 9th century monk named Kukai, posthumously known as the Kobo Daishi, who founded the Shingon school in 806. According to his writings, after achieving Sokushin Butsu, he intended to return in 5.67 million years to deliver the rest of us to Nirvana. The story comes from a biography written about 300 years later that claimed that Kukai, instead of dying of natural causes, instead entered a state of deep meditation in his tomb called Nyojo, basically meditation so deep it may as well be a living death. The climate of Japan isn't suited for the natural formation of mummies. The country has no peat bogs, arid deserts, or mountain peaks permanently ensconced in ice to dehydrate and preserve carcasses of both human and animal nature. So hardline Japanese Buddhists intent on mummification had to make do in their own way. The practice of self-mummification isn't only seen in Japan, however, Japanese monks are believed to be the only ones to trigger their own deaths via starvation. That said, researchers think that we've found another self-mummified monk in the Himalayas, and it even still has teeth! You may even be familiar with a recent discovery in the Dutch town of Amersfoort in 2014. A thousands of years old statue of the Buddha that had long been known to house a mummified monk on loan from China to the Drents Museum in the Netherlands was taken to a hospital to fully scan its inside. When they finally peered past the gold-plated outer layer of the statue using a CT scanner, they weren't surprised to find the fully preserved mummified corpse, thought to be of Buddhist master Liu Chen, who was a member of the Chinese meditation school circa 1100 AD, sitting in the lotus position. What they were surprised to find was that the monk's organs had been removed and replaced with strips of paper featuring spells and mantras, suggesting he was mummified after death. About 17 monks between 1081 and 1903 managed to successfully mummify themselves in life. The first recorded attempt was by a man named Shou Jin, who buried himself alive in hopes that he would return like Ku Kai to help deliver souls to Nirvana. Unfortunately, when Shou Jin's acolytes came back to recover his body, they found that he had not succeeded. His body had begun to decay. It wouldn't be another 200 years until someone could successfully mummify themselves and, in their philosophy, finally cheat death. The actual process was arduous. It took a minimum of three years to complete and required a diet called Mokuji Kikyo, directly translated as tree eating training. Monks would limit themselves to only nuts, roots, and buds from plants, basically anything you can forage on a mountain. Some say that they might have also eaten berries, bark from trees, and even pine needles. After a cycle of a thousand days on the diet, monks were said to be ready for Nyojo, but the majority did two or even three cycles before they were ready. That's over eight years eating nothing but roots. I'll uh, probably stick to Metamucil. After the final preparations were complete, the practitioner would stop eating and only drink a small amount of salt water while meditating and chanting mantras until their final breath. When that breath was near, the monk would get his disciples to put him into a bamboo box, lower him into a pit three meters deep, pack charcoal around the lid, punch a bamboo air hole, and then seal in their master alive. After that, the monk would continue to meditate inside of the tomb, ringing a bell now and then to show that he was still alive. When the bell stopped ringing, the same disciples would return, uncover his body to see if he died, and if he had, they would rebury him for another 1,000 days. After that, he would be uncovered once more to see if he'd begun to decompose. If he hadn't, he was now a Sokushin Butsu, and his body would become a shrine. If he decomposed, they'd exorcise him and rebury him with little celebration. Their diet had all kinds of spiritual importance, but in terms of mummification, it was brutal both for the body and also the bacteria and parasites that live on the body. See, decomposition is driven by bacteria, so anything that makes the body less hospitable to them increases the chance of mummification. It's also been suggested that monks would drink tea from the Toxicodendron verniculum tree bark, also known as the Japanese lacquer tree. The plant contains a toxic compound similar to poison ivy, 
The consumption of this tea would have a double purpose. One, it would kill them a little quicker, and two, it continued to ravage the microbiota that caused decomposition, ideally improving the chances of mummification. It should be mentioned that the practice of becoming Sokushinbutsu has been illegal in Japan since the Meiji Restoration around 1879. The country wanted to modernize itself and emulate foreign systems of government, and a culture of monks starving themselves before climbing into their own graves wasn't conducive to the new emperor's plans for the country. The Kato family claimed that Sogen had locked himself away to become a Sokushinbutsu, but whether or not that is true, the case shone a light on a little-known inefficiency the Japanese government was unaware of, or never had the political will to reform. Following the story, the Japanese government conducted a survey that found that as many as 230,000 centenarians, people aged 100 and above, were missing. But how do you lose that many people? The majority of the lost people were likely to have either died of national disasters or abroad during war. When Kato Sogen was found, those aged 65 and up made up a quarter of Japan's population. In 2022, this aging population has risen to almost 30%, and we expect that number to hit 40% by 2050. But still, this doesn't answer the question of why the Japanese government couldn't seem to keep track of these elderly folks. In 2010, about 20% 20 of citizen records were still written on paper. One ward in Tokyo had only finished digitizing their data that same year. However, the main issue in Japan is an old system of family record keeping called koseki, directly translated as household register. Basically, it's a documentation system that is kept and maintained by a single household with information on every member of a family with details on major milestones that affect census data. It's all the documentation we have in one, birth, death, marriage, and divorce certificates all combined into one form. Oi Susumu, the section chief of Suganami Ward's records department, says that the koseki is your ID from cradle to grave based on the family unit. It's proof of your roots. Huh, that's catchy. The register system based on households dates back to the 19th century and was originally used to facilitate conscription, mandatory military service. As long as citizens lived in the same households with extended families, stayed put, and actually updated their registers, it worked perfectly. Nowadays though, many young people live in single households and may move far away from their home villages, even abroad. Oi continues, saying, If no one in your family reports births, deaths, and marriage, these won't be recorded in the koseki. In other words, people begin to disappear. What happens is a number of Japanese citizens, at least in the books, living upwards of 150 years, with one man listed as old as 200. The problem was clear. It's not feasible to physically check every single elderly person in this ward, said Tsukunami Ward Head of Senior Citizens Section, Wakui Yoshihisa. We now have 54,000 residents aged 75 and over, so we need to monitor them indirectly. How do you track people indirectly? The easiest way is to record their use of public services, like healthcare and Meals on Wheels. However, it's not perfect. People will still fall through the cracks. The only way to ensure that every person is accounted for is to issue personal, individualized identification that is used to access government services. Sodei Takako, gerontologist and professor emeritus at Ochanomizu University in Tokyo, argued at the time of Sogen Kato's discovery that it was time to switch to an individual ID system, like many other countries. If the local government tried to find the whereabouts of people over 70 or 75, the number of missing people will be doubled or maybe sometimes three times. The worry was that unless the Koseki system is updated and an individual ID system is implemented, Japan's recent and prolonged economic slowdown will mean that more and more families will be dependent on elderly members' pensions to survive. Unless something is done, then more deaths will be obscured behind family registers, leaving more opportunities for fraud. There's good news though. The Japanese government did implement an individual ID system called My Number in 2015. They even made a rabbit mascot named Maina-chan. 
This individual ID system is only in its infancy, and the Koseki system is still widely in use across Japan, so it'll be hard to tell if the change is making a significant difference in helping the government avoid fraud and letting the dead rest. The real number of centenarians was grossly exaggerated in the old system. However, there are still an awesome amount of people over the age of 100 living in Japan. In 2022, of a population of 125 million, that number hit 90,526, a rate of 72 people over the age of 100 per 100,000 people, which is crazy if you consider that out of the US population of 336 million in 2021, there were 89,739 citizens over the age of 100, a rate of only 26 people over the age of 100 per 100,000 people. The US has over twice the population that Japan does, yet have the same number of individuals older than 100. Canada, of a population of 38 million, only has 9,545 as of 2021. We'll get there someday, and I'm doing my part. I'll never die. Interestingly enough, of those aged 100 and above, 80%, give or take, are women. Isn't that crazy? Oh, and speaking of women, currently, the oldest person in Japan is a woman, Tatsumi Fusa, at the ripe age of 115. You go, girl. Japanese people are famed for their longevity. They have low mortality rates from heart disease, breast cancer, and prostate cancer, likely due to their balanced diet and high intake of plants like soybeans and non-sugar sweetened drinks like green tea. Japanese people also have low death rates from infectious or cerebrovascular disease, as well as low mortality rates from pneumonia. All of these things and more contribute to the phenomenal life expectancy seen in Japanese citizens. Unfortunately, a population that lives so long, coupled with a system easily exploited, well, that's how you lose 230,000 people. Hopefully, with the new ID system, no more elderly Japanese citizens will fall through the cracks. But as their population ages and their birth rate stagnates, the coming years will pose many challenges for the Japanese government and the Japanese people to overcome. Based on our last video about a man who also died from tea, but not by choice, we played a little game on Twitter, and congratulations, only 15% of you chose the tea of death. The man in the video was assassinated, but the strange substance in the tea had never been used as poison before in history, and for good reason. 